Welcome back, everybody. This is the time to the to the literature panel after the success of the philosophy panel one of this morning. Uh, first, Manuel Herrero Puertas from National Taiwan University will present a paper entitled Toward a Theory of Embodied Boredom, Edgar Allan Poe's Hop Frog. Manuel Herrero Puertas is assistant professor of foreign languages and literature uh, at National Taiwan University, where he teaches courses on early American literature, 19th century American literature, and disability studies. He writes on the intersection of literature, discourses of disability, and political fantasy, which sounds very, very interesting. So please, uh, Manuel, whenever you want. Thank you so much. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, good evening over here. Uh, thank you to the organizers for uh, inviting me and for the online arrangements. Uh, I am very new to boredom studies, so um, I am both excited and nervous to speak here today. Uh, and I, I, I will also serve my presentation. So bear with me for a second. Okay, are you able to see my screens, my slides? Uh, okay. Sorry about that. Uh, let me try again. Uh, we were seeing your presentation just 10 seconds ago. <laughs> okay, let me see if I can put it out there again. What about now? Yes. Okay, excellent. All right, uh, so that's my title slide, and I'll begin my presentation here. You're not hungry, you're just bored has become a 21st century catchphrase. It has traveled from dietitians, playbooks, and self-care magazines to coffee mugs, refrigerator magnets, and internet memes. At its most literal, the phrase delivers a warning about confusing the mind's craving for amusement with the body's craving for food. When we tell someone or ourselves, you're not hungry, you're just bored, we presume a mind and a body whose longings converge in rather unconscious ways. The phrase thus stakes a forceful anti-Cartesianism that so far remains understudied. Aiming to remedy this inattention, I pose a few opening questions. If boredom is more than a mental state, how does it register at the level of the body's materiality? Is there such a thing as psychic hunger? Or to put it differently, can we visualize boredom as an empty stomach of the mind? And if so, what does this psychosomatic conflation tell us about how we eat and how we consume entertainment. Today, my goal is to explore the rhetorical history and implications of this perpetual loop between hunger and boredom. To that end, my case study is going to be a, a very non-boring tale about boredom, Edgar Allan Poe's 1849 short story, Hop Frog. I argue that this text helps us understand key shifts in the intersection of boredom and fatness from the advent of industrial modernity in the 19th century to the present day. Let me begin though, not with literature, but with science. In 1977, Edward Abramson and Sean Stinson, two clinical psychologists at California State University, conducted a pioneer experiment. They asked several obese and non-obese participants 
to complete a series of tasks ranging from stimulating to outright repetitive and boring. Food in the form of snacks was available to them at all times. The experiment showed, and I quote, that boredom markedly increases food consumption for both groups, proving that there is no correlation between previous weight and food consumption when facing a boring task. Eating our way out of boredom was deemed then a more or less universal defense mechanism that scientists since then have tried to understand better. More recently, Renko C. Habermas and a team of psychologists and neuroscientists at Maastricht University have confirmed, and I quote, that binge eating might be motivated by a desire to escape what they call boredom's emotional distress. However, they also realize that this defense mechanism entails, paradoxically, an element of self-destruction. Through an experiment that combined chocolate m and with self-administered minor electric shocks, Habermas and his team concluded that, quote, when bored, one might even go so far as to hurt oneself just to escape monotony. So the study was interesting because it proved that, you know, when we overeat as a response to boredom, we are aware that that is a harmful choice, but nonetheless, we are willing to pay that price as long as it you know, allows us to, to keep boredom at bay. In 2015, another study redefined boredom as a meaning threat. Like hunger, boredom slows down time and flattens perception to a point where the foundations of the self start to crumble, opening up an existential void that food alone cannot fill. So if these experiments prove something, then is that we are not just hungry or bored, we are scared. These findings are not that surprising if we examine the degree to which food and consumption metaphors pervade boredom's intellectual history. Already in the 17th century, Pascal cautioned that without the hunger for spiritual things, one is bored. Like the phrase, you're not hungry, you're just bored, Pascal's dictum blends psychological and physiological phenomena. This metaphorical intermixing of the material, the spiritual, and a simultaneous desire for both intensified during the epistemic shift from pre-modern Assyria to the more or less aristocratic Enumi that flourished in the 18th century. In the 19th century, Enumi morphed into a wider range of boredoms. By then, boredom constituted a prerequisite for existential and metaphysical insight. I'm thinking of Beatrice's paper on Schopenhauer and the, you know, the paradigm of the, the bored philosopher who discovers truth via being bored. But boredom was also a symptom of a morally decadent bourgeoisie. It was also the bread and butter of a working class trapped in cycles of forced labor and alienated from the pleasures of consumerism and leisure. So Elizabeth Goodstein has described these developments and these ramifications as a democratization of boredom. In this new scenario, bored people eat and boredom eats people. The bored subject is a consumer trying to avoid being consumed. For example, Gustave Flaubert, that's my second quote there, Wonder about that modern boredom which gnaws at a man's entrails. Madame du Diffin, an influential salon hostess and patron of the arts in late 18th century France, also saw boredom as a bear solitaire, a solitary worm that devoured the very meaning of existence, regardless of one's wealth or status. Almost a century later, Charles Baudelaire uh, the, perhaps the main apostle of modern boredom, wrote about the man of the age who in a young would swallow the world. So you see, we're always falling back in these metaphors of ingestion, digestion, swallowing, eating, being eaten. In his classic essay, Boredom, Self and Culture, 
Son Desmond Healy brings the hunger boredom trope to a climax. Healy contends that, quote, boredom is the equivalent not of non-hunger, but of anti-hunger, indeed of a revulsion against the very idea of eating, a psychic anorexia. So Healy blames 20th century boredom not on the absence of proper stimulation, but on a prototypically aloof individual, one for whom showing interest in somebody or something signals a kind of weakness. So Healy calls this state hyperboredom, which is epitomized by the Rolling Stones hit, I can get no satisfaction. But one might as well argue the opposite. That's not hyperboredom also lead to hyper eating. In his attempt to deliver a Jeremiah against a faithless post-World War II civilization, Healy forgets the second line of the song's chorus, which Mick Jagger sings with characteristic hedonism, because I try and I try and I try and I try. Based on the empirical evidence I have already mentioned, he might as well be singing and I eat and I eat and I eat. Long story short, boredom triggers a hyper interest, an unquenchable thirst for cultural stimuli. And if we keep in mind the song, it's so interesting that the singer in Satisfaction is telling us how he engages with all these acts of media consumption. He's, you know, listening to the radio, watching the news, and the song is about that. So, um, so yeah, I think Healy uh, didn't choose a, a very good example there. When they intersect social constructions of boredom and fatness in most Western societies tend to stigmatize boredom prone individuals for their unregulated appetite rather than for the lack thereof. In her remarkable cultural history of fatness and fat shaming, Amy Farrell Erdman digs out a continuum between the girthy giants of medieval iconography and an increasingly overweight middle class in the 19th century. Whereas medieval writers use fat to signify an excess of power that easily leads to tyranny, 19th century cartoonists and social commentators berated the middle class fat person, unable to regulate the abundance of the modern world. As Erdman observes, what was supposed to be funny about these people was their unbridled enjoyment of the privileges that had once been reserved for the upper class. Travel, shopping excursions, theater, and of course, good eating. Somewhat ironically, the same magazines and publications that fed literary entertainment to the masses, issues like Life or Harper's Weekly, started to feature around the 1860s advertisements for exercise belts, diuretics, and emulsions among other medical and pseudo-medical solutions to the problem of fatness. The average citizen was premised then not as removed or uninterested, but as an all-consuming subject, a devourer of everything. It is at this historical juncture that Poe's Hop Frog offers a productive yet unacknowledged critique of embodied boredom and its implications for cultural production. For those of you who are not familiar with the tale, let me offer a bit of a summary. The eponymous character Hop Frog and his ballerina friend Tripetta are two dwarfs kidnapped from their remote homeland and forced to work as jesters for a despotic king and his seven ministers. The king and his ministers are powerful, huge, and dangerously bored. Poe describes them as large, corpulent, oily men, as well as inimitable jokers. They're always journeying for practical jokes, stories, gags, masquerades. In one scene, after the king impels Hop Frog to drink wine against his will and humiliates Tripetta, Hop Frog concocts his revenge. He persuades the king to host a masquerade and to dress up with his counselors as a group of unleashed orangutans. The ruse is a success. 
enabling hop frog to change them together, lift them up in the air, and then set them on fire in front of a horrified audience. So that's what you see in the illustration in my slide. After a final speech in which he declares this coup, my last jest, Hop Frog escapes with Tripetta, leaving behind the scorched bodies of the king and his helpers, turned into, quote, a fetid, blackened, hideous, and indistinguishable mass. Mass is indeed a recurrent theme in the story, specifically the relationship between boredom and bodily mass. Poe announces this nexus in the first paragraph. Whether people grow fat by joking or whether there is something in fat itself which predisposes to a joke, I have never been quite able to determine, but certain it is that a lean joker is a rara avis in terris. So by joker here, Poe means somebody who consumes jokes, not someone who's producing them, who's, you know, uh, creating them. The king's appetite is accordingly linked both to body size and to his hyper interest in jokes and pranks. The narrator explicitly compares him to Rabelais Gargantua. His cabinet council always features a table filled to the brim with viands and wine, a visual reminder of the cabinet's constant demand for amusement. Such a demand may be conceptualized after Habermas and these other clinical researchers as an attempt to escape monotony. In fact, the uh, king himself complains to Hop Frog, we want characters, characters, man, something novel, out of the way. We are wearied with this everlasting sameness. Poe's characterization of the king oscillates between the iconography of the tyrannical giant, hence the gargantua connection, and the fat shaming of a consumer middle class that by 1849 already struggled to keep boredom at bay. The fact that Poe settles on not one, but eight morbidly obese villains suggests a class critique, and to a certain extent, an injunction of a mass reading public, also desperate for characters, for novelty. So I'm also interested in how the mass in the story is the fat of the body, but also the mass culture, the mass reading public. Therefore, Poe no longer adheres to fatness as an index of power and ambition. One thinks, for example, of Hans Holbein's famous, very dignified portrait of Henry VIII. Instead, as Arthur Rackham capturing this popular illustration, the bulging king and ministers partake of an abject grotesqueness. In fact, in one of the story's most enigmatic moments, linkages between fat and boredom, the king and his ministers struggle to think of a costume for the mass because, quote, they found it difficult on account of being so fat to make up their minds. So you see how Poe is constantly overlapping you know, the sort of mental and uh, fleshly or corporeal phenomena. The contrast between the excessive bodies of the king and his ministers on the one hand and the insufficient bodies of Hop Frog and Tripetta on the other dramatizes an unequal division of labor with bored audiences accumulating in their own flesh the labor and capital they extract from tiny hop frog and tripeta. The narrator explains how historically court jesters and buffoons were expected to be always ready with sharp witticisms at a moment's notice in consideration of the crumbs that fell from the royal table. So you see how this hunger of boredom leads to a kind of class vampirism with one class literally sucking dry the bodies of, of the producers. It makes sense for Hopfrog then to exact his revenge by turning his foes into one single body mass and then reducing it to ashes. Doing so, he reverts the logic of accumulation by which boredom leads to overconsumption. Poe never solves the story's opening dilemma, namely whether there is something in fat which predisposes to a joke. 
As I have shown, psychologists, nutritionists today continue to battle with this conundrum. Do we overeat because we are bored? Or are we bored because we have too much, too many options to eat, among other things? While Paul leaves the dilemma unsolved, he exposes the consequences of uncritically equating eating food and consuming art. And so his final jest, um, keep in mind that Hop Frog was the last story Poe ever published, is to take a jab at a mass reading public that wolves down literature as an escape from the existential mirror that boredom places in front of them. Today, reading Hop Frog through the intersecting angles of boredom studies and fat studies urges us to rethink new habits of cultural consumption. After all, Netflix no longer asks us if we want to watch another episode. It spoon feeds it to us right away. With just a few mouse clicks, we can download more hours of music than we can listen to in a lifetime. Ubiquitous tactile screens in taxi cabs, subway stations, and of course, our own smartphones replace all forms of boredom, you know, sort of filling that time between events, with a new boredom characterized by a surplus of stimuli that eventually induces this passive mechanic consumption and mental stupor. The empty stomach of our minds has become a bottomless pit. No wonder then our tendency to fight this new boredom by keeping our actual stomachs satiated. As being bored and being hungry become one and the same thing, Poe offers him hop frog a cautionary tale about a culture industry whose only goal is to rescue us from our bored selves, one snack at a time. Thank you. Thank you so very much, uh, Manuel. Uh, I didn't even know the, about Poe's relationship with boredom. Uh, just a, a word before giving you place to your questions. We tend to think that a psychologist uh, working on boredom wouldn't be interested in a literature panel. But your presentation demonstrated that this is a wrong idea. This is the aim of the, of the conference. So I'm very happy with your, your presentation. So please, if you have questions, you can just uh, press the rise up button and just speak. Uh, Should I just? Yeah, thank you. Uh, sorry about not being able to still to switch my camera on. Hopefully, I'll rectify that for for later panel. But the, your your last thought about um, the link between boredom and this abundance of stimuli, or the uh, let's say uh, over abundance of options available to consumers, uh, kind of brings to mind this famous Mark Fisher's quote about no one being bored. Well, everything is still quite boring. And uh, I was wondering if that is more or less what you meant, that uh, we are no longer capable of feeling boredom uh, in its original sense, although it's still there. We're, we're just left sort of overwhelmed by the superficial uh, abundance of possible options. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, thank you so much for the quote. I, I would certainly track it down and, and keep it handy. And yes, uh, you know, riffing on that last thought, I'm, I'm interested in the ways that uh, boredom disguises itself as something else. Uh, hunger, it's a kind of physiological disguise uh, of boredom. And that's what, hence all the emphasis on, you know, when you go on a diet, you need to keep yourself entertained. And, you know, I've been reading about that and it's quite fascinating how, you know, weight loss kind of goes through keeping yourself entertained to so trying to keep the, the phantom of boredom uh, at bay. But uh, another, another kind of disguise is the, the sort of multitasking, uh, sort of hyper-connected uh, contemporary self who never looks bored. I mean, you go on the subway, 
and I look around, I don't see people being bored because they're plugged to their phones. They are reading, chatting, uh, texting. You know, um, th that's not that sort of nothingness or flatness that we usually associate with boredom. So I guess Poe has been very useful to conceptualize that idea, to think of, of boredom as not the absence of stimuli, but a, but a kind of storm of stimuli. And, and I think that uh, Hop Frog's revenge is precisely, to a certain extent, is to, you know, when he burns them on the torch and he hangs them up and it's this kind of uh, horrifying scene, is directing everybody's attention to that traumatic event. And he's sort of going back to um, uh, a dynamic in which, you know, th there's just one single thing capturing your attention. So, you know, the, the, the violence of that scene in the end is, is about doing that. It's about calling attention to one focal point. So yeah, the, the, the quote you share is very useful in that, in that sense, so, so thank you. Yes, Jan. Thank you for a wonderful presentation. Um, indeed, it was interesting for a psychologist and uh, I thought I would share an author that you may be interested in, Philip Cushman uh, okay. has written an article called The Empty Self. And uh, his book is called something to the effect of constructing the self in America or something like that. And it's a historical look at how the sense of self has evolved and been constructed um, with special reference to how it's been constructed within psychology. And uh, it would very much be in line with your analysis, your analysis and your thoughts. You might, you might find that interesting. And the one question I had or thought um, was, um, in addition to thinking about the self as, as empty or, or in, in need of consumption, or you talk about then the overstimulation as well, another angle that interests me on this would be the idea that in these moments, the self has been objectified and in objectifying the self, uh, a whole bunch of things follow from that, from that position as well. And so that might be another interesting uh, way to explore some of the ideas that you presented to us today. But it's very mm -hmm. stimulating. And indeed, I didn't know about uh, Poe's uh, this, this story either. So I'm keen to follow up and read this after. So thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for the suggestions. And I will certainly I am not a psychologist, so I would appreciate any lead in, in that direction to, you know, to, to make sure that I got my, my psychology right. Um, and yeah, as you know, as you said, this is the last story he wrote, and there is a tendency to read it as a revenge on the reading public that demanded this sort of cheap entertainment and this kind of sensational, uh, kind of gothic horror fiction, where what he wanted was to, you know, be more of an respected intellectual. So there's a sort of anti-mercantilist critique there that the king is us, we are we are being burned at, at the end as well. But that's something that again, you can apply to, I'm thinking of the, you know, the, the, the dictum we hear over and over today that, you know, with social media, you are the product. So, you know, you're logging into Facebook, Snapchat, Instagram, um, and you're consuming whatever is there, but you are also being consumed. So I'm, I'm, I'm trying to think of that analogy in relation to, to you know, the, the plot of the story, but also the, the culture industry and the, the literary marketplace and how these tensions uh, made it really hard for people like Poe to, to write, to make a living being cultural producers. So yeah, thank you very much. <laughs>